Good day and welcome to another segment of In the Spotlight. I'm Superintendent Michael Richard, and today I'm pleased to be joined by three elected officials from Western Massachusetts, Senator James Welch, Senator Eric Lesser, and Representative Michael Finn. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank All right, you. we'll start it off real easy and then we'll get into some more challenging stuff. Why don't you tell the audience at home a little bit about yourselves, where you grew up, where you went to school, and what you're doing right now uh, as elected officials. And Jim, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's a great show. Thanks for having us on. Uh, my name is Jim Welch, a state senator. I represent uh, West Springfield, Chicopee, and Springfield in the Massachusetts State Senate. Uh, it's my fifth term and uh, just recently elected to my fifth term in the state Senate. Prior to that, I worked. Uh, I was a state representative for three terms where I represented uh, smaller portions of Springfield, Chicopee, and all of the city of West Springfield. Uh, and before that, uh, I worked in financial services, graduated from Westfield State College, uh, attended Springfield Technical Community College, and of course graduated high school from, uh, from not this actual building in West Springfield, but West Springfield High School in 1993. Grew up in West Springfield, had a great childhood, and uh, much of uh, the great experience that I had in West Springfield led me to want to uh, seek uh, a profession in public service because of all the great things that uh, I was able to enjoy and, and, and partake in, in our community. So uh, moving backwards, that's a little bit about my life. And uh, uh, West Springfield's a great place to, to grow up, raise a family, and, and uh, uh, participate in, in work. So uh, glad to be here. Glad Good. to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Senator Lesser. <clears throat> well, thanks for having me, Michael, and uh, thanks of, to my colleague, Senator Welch, and Representative Finn for letting me cross the river over here uh, into West Springfield. It's great to be here and to have the chance to sit down with you and, of course, to talk to uh, everyone at home watching. So I'm from Longmeadow, uh, grew up there. I was actually originally born in Queens, New York. My family moved uh, to Western Massachusetts when I was seven because my parents uh, got, uh, got jobs here. And my first real experience in politics was actually in high school. Uh, I was a junior in high school when the school principal at the time called all of us into an assembly and said that there were going to be dozens of teachers that weren't, weren't going to come back the next year because of budget cuts made, frankly, nowhere near us uh, out of the state house 90 miles east. And I remember as a 16-year-old feeling really angry um, that 14 and 15 and 16-year-olds were going to be asked to pay the price for decisions made. Uh, somewhere else. So we worked to organize a, a Prop 2.5 override to help plug that gap in funding. And we were able to rip up those uh, those pink slips at the end of that effort. And it was a real lesson for me at an early age that despite the messiness and frustrations of politics, and there's quite a lot of that, uh, that it still remains you know one of the most powerful ways to make a difference. So uh, caught the bug from there. Um, had the um, honor of working for President Obama for four years, starting on his campaign in 2007, and uh, came home um, uh, to Western Mass, and I'm now just started my third term. So uh, more junior than, than both Senator Welch and, and Rep Finn, but they've been good teachers uh, and showed me the ropes, and uh, <laughs> I've enjoyed uh, getting to work now on some really vital issues uh, for our schools, for our communities, you know, right in the same community where I grew up. So, good. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Representative Finn. Thank you. It's always great to go last. You could do the closer, <laughs> if you will. Um, so a little bit about myself. I grew up, I was born and raised right here in West Springfield, right up on Heritage Lane, uh, the street that abuts this property. And so um, academically, I went to St. Thomas, and then I went to St. Mary's, and then I went to uh, North Adams State College up in the uh, North Adams Mass. And I've served on the West Springfield City Council for eight years and now um, just starting my ninth and tenth years in the legislature. So I've really enjoyed, you know, working and serving the people of West Springfield, you know, the community that I uh, fondly grew up in. Good, good. Well, Mike, why don't I stick with you for a second? Mm -hmm. sure. um, lots of uh, lots of issues. As politicians, you're 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 getting you're you're fielding you know, calls and, and emails and, and dilemmas from, from every angle. But in your estimation, what are the top two pressing issues that you are facing right now as a legislator? So that they're, picking two is going to be difficult. You know, I would think that, you know, one of the most pressing issues uh, for this legislative session is obviously going to be the Ed Reform Bill or the, um, the Ed Reform Commission's findings that, that are out there. And, and what are we going to do about making sure that, um, you know, all of our schools are adequately funded. That'd probably be the top of the pile. And then secondly, um, you know, I think that it, it for me, uh, my, my role in government is always about making sure that 
local resources are there, you know, and so speaking in addition to what we want to do for educational funding, but making sure that, you know, the, the district that I represent gets the resources from Boston that we fully deserve. And, you know, whether that's, um, you know, the local aid, uh, Chapter 90 monies, uh, UGA, unrestricted general government aid, you know, all those categories, making sure that we do all we can to make sure that, you know, the town of West Springfield and the other precincts that I represent in Chicopee and Springfield get the resources that we deserve. Okay, good. Senator Lesser. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks for having me, Michael. And uh, I ditto to everything that, uh, you know, Representative Finn said. Um, you know, zooming out, what I would I also just add is I think at the end of the day that the single most important issue uh, and really all of the challenges we face, whether it's disparities in, in health care funding or in education funding or the substance abuse crisis, I think are symptoms of a, of a bigger trend we've seen here in Western Mass, which is a generation ago, West Springfield, Springfield, the whole Pioneer Valley was dotted with factories, Uniroyal, Westinghouse, American Bosch, and on and on, Indian motorcycles that had thousands and thousands of families supported with good middle-class jobs that paid good wages, that provided health insurance, that provided pensions and sound retirements. Unfortunately, we know what happened, which is many of those companies left and their workers were laid off. And while certain areas of the country, for example, Boston, New York, San Francisco, were able to make that transition to a more high-tech sort of knowledge um, and higher education-oriented economy, Western Mass, while we've made progress in that direction, um, we have a lot of catching up to do. And, and our economy has not kept pace with the red-hot growth we see all around us. So I think at the end of the day, the, the fundamental challenge we have is how do we continue to grow the economy? How do we continue to create large numbers of good paying jobs that give people stable retirements, give people um, access to a, you know, a, a good middle class life, um, and do it in a way that's inclusive of all our communities. So education, absolutely uh, is a big part of that. Infrastructure, rail investment, connecting us to the red hot economies you see just to our east, just to our south are a part of that. Good affordable health insurance um, and good affordable ability to save for retirement are part of that. But uh, I would say, you know, the real fundamental challenge we have is how do we continue to grow the economy, bring jobs in, bring investment into Western Mass, and very importantly, keep our young families here. Because we see a very alarming trend in Western Mass, which is a lot of our young people who grow up here have to feel like they have to leave uh, in order to find good jobs uh, elsewhere. And, and long term, that will be a dangerous trend unless we do work to reverse it. Sure. Very good. Thank you. Senator Welch. Well, uh, just like the other, my colleagues here, education, of course, is always a priority. Education funding and education reform will be a big topic this, this upcoming legislative session. Health care, affordable health care, um, but really, you know, what we can do in the health care space and the health care industry to, to make it more consumer friendly, more patient centered. Um, and of course, you know, fighting and advocating to bring resources back to Western Massachusetts. Right now, uh, we as a legislative delegation are trying to work on uh, bringing back funding or bringing back a proposal to, to, to fund a new courthouse in, in Springfield for Hamden County, which is a, a major economic investment uh, project for Western Massachusetts. I would say one uh, issue that I'll be focusing on um, this year and continuing to focus on is the issue of surprise billing when it comes to uh, health care. Uh, when a person goes in and has a health care procedure, and it's such a complicated process, especially the administrative process and the billing process, that oftentimes when everything's all said and done after the procedure is done and the dust is settled, uh, the patient receives this surprise bill in the mail. And it happens to, to many people. They say, you know, sometimes maybe 10% of all type uh, of all procedures end up with a surprise bill coming into the mail to in the mail to somebody who uh, received that procedure. Uh, what I'm going to be working on and continue to work on is is developing a process and developing a, a default rate, if you will, to prevent that surprise bill from coming in the mail weeks or months after uh, that procedure is done. And uh, for me, it's a it's a consumer protection issue, a, pain, a patient centered, consumer centered issue. Um, and in, in reality, it's, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed and should have been addressed a long time ago. Good. Well, I'll make sure I don't send you a bill. <laughs> <laughs> would be a surprise for sure. Uh, but it, I, I know from experience uh, yeah. what that's like, yeah. and it is, uh, that is frustrating for sure. And I know each of you has um, different things that you're tackling 
that, that address our communities um, specifically and then obviously the state uh, generally. But selfishly, uh, I'm very interested in, in knowing what your thoughts are about, about the ed reform approach and how, how we're going to tackle the foundation budget issue. So um, I did last night at, at school committee open up uh, extend an invitation to the community. If anybody had a question they wanted me to ask you, uh, that they could do that. I got I got a couple of responses, and they were all around the same thing. So um, I, I sort of pared it down. So the question is from Bill in West Springfield: Is uh, what proposed educational funding reform bill do you support, and why? And Eric, I'll start with you. <laughs> Great. Well, well. So again, you know, I, I think that we actually, you know, backing up a second, we have really a once in a generation opportunity in front of us with the with the review of the foundation budget. You know, the last time an education um, effort was made on this scale was 1993, uh, which of course is a very long time ago. A lot in the world has changed since then. So um, I do think we need to really be thoughtful about this moment. Uh, you know, I think at the top of the list is resources. We, we do not have enough resources in our local public schools certainly to adequately pay our teachers to provide for um, issues like special education. The costs have skyrocketed since 1993 when that formula was written. And there's a lot of um, silent costs or costs that were much smaller back when the first formula was written that really need to be rethought. For example, the cost of health insurance uh, for employees is not adequately funded now. The cost of um, retirement obligations, the cost of special education, the cost of English language learners and some of the unique needs around those communities. So I think we, we, we've got a full plate of items that we need to work on, but at the top of the list is we need more resources in our public schools. And by the way, the stakes are higher now because in 1993 it was a different type of economy. The stakes of getting a good education and what that means for someone and for their future moving forward, their ability to get a good job, their ability to be, you know, to make the most of their participation in the economy is, is more important than ever. We've got the best schools in the country in Massachusetts, so we, you know, we want to we want to appreciate and, 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 and give, um, give due uh, credit to our educators who have made that possible, uh, but there's a lot more we need to do to maintain uh, competition, and I think at the top of the list it has to be more resources. So are you taking a position behind any of those proposed bills uh, about which one you want to throw your support? Well, there's, there's, there's literally, I yeah. think, dozens, dozens of, of different them. proposals. So they, they need to be worked out. There sure. was a, a major hearing at the, at the State House last Friday mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, hundreds, literally hundreds of people from all over, the, uh, all over the country and the community, so actually all over the country, people from all over the country are watching this, but from all over the Commonwealth uh, it showed up to, to testify. You know, we are going through a process of engaging with our local school committees, our local educators educators are very importantly students and parents who are important stakeholders in this as well. Um, so I think the top of the list for me is really investing in and making sure that our schools have adequate resources and that unfunded obligations like special education, school transportation for regional districts is another example. Some of the specific needs you have in, in low-income communities that have really, um, you know, really substantial obligations to meet in terms of closing achievement gaps that we get at that, and then we need to also think through about things like vocational education. You know, I think there's an argument to be made that over the last 20 years or so, we've de-emphasized voc ed, um, which I think has been a mistake because you have a lot of great jobs available, especially in Western Mass, in things like HVAC and things like advanced manufacturing, precision machining, and we have waiting lists at our voc ed schools. So there are a lot of elements to this that we need to that we need to think through. Um, but I really do think at the top of the list. The threshold value needs to be making sure that every kid in Massachusetts, no matter where they live or who their family is, gets the opportunity that they deserve to make the most of themselves and of their future careers through a good education. Good. So, Jim, you know, here in West Springfield, and, and the same thing will be for, uh, for you, Mike. Uh, you know, we have actually made a great effort to emphasize uh, the vocational process in terms of sending more students to Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative, uh, forming that Pathways to Prosperity relationship that we've had over the last six years, turning it into having West Springfield being designated as an innovation pathway uh, school district in the, in the Commonwealth, one of only a select few. Um, how do all those things factor into your approach to uh, addressing this foundation formula? 
Well, I, West Springfield, I think, is a great example, and congratulations for, for doing such a great job. Obviously, just like any school district, there's always room for us to improve, which is, I think, a goal for us to always always have in mind. And uh, But West Springfield, my son uh, Thomas goes to the to the middle school and is joining a, a, a great time, having a great time there, having great uh, success, and uh, loves his teachers and loves his school, and um, I think it's a, uh, it's a great place to learn. Um, you know, in terms of the, you know, the the proposals that'll be coming up to, or that are uh, presented to us this legislative session, as was stated before, there's many proposals. Uh, we did have the uh, the hearing last week, which I was able to to, to go down and testify uh, on behalf of uh, the the legislation to support uh, the the effort behind you know bringing us up to the fun foundation budget re review commission's recommendations in terms of funding school districts. There are a couple areas that I um, you know, highlighted during my my testimony, and I you know are kind of you know areas that I would like to see um, either avoided or part of the the plan. And uh, one area is we need to to fix the charter school uh, formula and how it affects the public school students. Um, you know, in terms of the funding and the funding going from uh, the public schools to the charter schools. Um, in my in my opinion. You know, if the charter schools are going to exist, it can't be, um, they can't be developed on the backs of the public schools and the public school students. Um, the other area is when we're talking about uh, bringing more resources or putting more resources into the foundation budget, um, you know, those school districts that are challenged, and let's face it, many school districts that are challenged, um, um, you know, and when you look at the results and the, the graduation rates and the MCAS scores, uh, there's a direct correlation between uh, those results and, you know, economic, um, social economic issues. And my fear, and, and I caution the panel, I caution the committee, and, and I know the governor's proposal has, um, you know, part of his proposal would, would attach strings, if you will, to that funding um, that certain... Um, you know, reforms would have to be adopted before certain school districts would be able to access certain funding. Um, and I'd caution the panel and I caution the, the committee and said, you know, don't put too many strings or don't put unsurmountable strings uh, for some school districts that are struggling um, in place uh, to prevent them from, from being able to, to get that funding. Because the reality is those school districts need that funding to be able to, to, to boost themselves up higher and be able to, to achieve the greatness that, that we all know that all kids can. Um, but we can't forget that correlation, that direct correlation, socioeconomic to the results that are that we see in the classroom uh, in graduation rates and scores. Um, so those are two areas that I'd like to focus on. But in the end, uh, we have to find a way to pay for it, which will probably um, involve some sort of tax increase or revenue uh, enhancements, so to speak. Uh, and that's a commitment that we're going to have to uh, decide if we want to make as a commonwealth uh, here in Massachusetts. So uh, big decisions lie ahead, but I think we're ready to do it. And I think uh, the topic of education and investing in our kids is really uh, a priority uh, issue that I think we're all ready to talk about. Good. Mike, your colleagues have touched on a lot of things, mm -hmm. including um, the charter school uh, issue yeah. that I know has been one that's been passionate here in West Springfield with the opening of Hamden Charter right. School of Science West. And um, I'm wondering if you maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, about that and the implications. I can tell you that right now we expect to lose, West Springfield Public Schools expect to lose about 100 students next year uh, to surrounding charter schools. And that's going to have a significant impact on our funding resources as we're pushing money out to those charter schools. So you don't have to talk exclusively about that, but I know you've been a part of those conversations uh, moving forward. So I'll, I'll open it up to you. So uh, I just would like to touch base um, going back a second before we talk about the charters, about the generally speaking about the bills that are out there about yes. the ed reform. So there's in general, I mean, there are dozens, but there's there's three main bills that are out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. One was filed by the governor. One was filed by uh, Senator Sonia Chang Diaz, and the other one was filed by my colleague in the House, Rep. Paul Tucker. The general principle or differences in those bills are, you know, the the amount of time that is allowed for the Commonwealth to get to full funding of the ed reform, right. and so uh, in. Um, Eric and Jim's colleagues' bill, Senator Chung, I'm sorry, Sonia Chang Diaz's bill. Uh, it's an immediate, you know, zero to 100. We're there. Uh, and Rep. Paul Tucker's bill, it's a zero to five year implementation, and you know that's important. 
And then in the governor's bill, it's, I think it's a zero to seven year fully Im implemented uh, schedule, funding schedule. And then as Senator Welch had said, there were certain strings that are attached there. And so from a personal point of view, I'm more, I guess, in line with Rep Tucker's bill. I think it's a, it's a modest compromise between the zero to 100 and the seven year out, outlook. Um, but the other part of that question is really, for me, similar, uh, exactly, I should say, to what Senator Welch had mentioned, which was where does the money come from? And so for me as a you know, representative, I you know, have the town of West Springfield and Chicopee and Springfield to think about. And the one thing that I have yet to hear is where are these revenues going to come from? And so, you know, it's, we're not just going to be able to wave a magic wand and say, all right, well, we just found an extra billion dollars or we can, uh, you know, and he, here's the money and this is what we're going to do. And I think it's, you know, incumbent upon me as a representative to say, you know, like, well, well what is that uh, concrete proposal? How do we get there? And does it make sense? Because, you know, if the if the flip side of that equation is, all right, we're going to give the monies to the schools, but we're going to have to take money from other areas, you know, until you know what those other areas are, it's a very difficult decision to make. Like, am I willing to sacrifice funding for the soldiers' homes? Am I willing to sacrifice funding on, um, you know, SNAP programs, you know, feeding families? Like, these are, you know, incredibly difficult decisions, and, you know, until until there's an agreement, until there's a real solid proposal for how we get there, you know, I think the, you know, the prudent path would be to just say, you know, let's, I'm, I'm willing to study this issue a bit further. And so I know that we're, there's a solid push to do this as we move forward to get it done this session. And I'm really hopeful that we, you know, get there. But those are some of the, you know, the, the more significant uh, hurdles, if you will, to getting there. So Back to the um, the original question, which was you know the charter schools. So, charter schools, it's a really interesting thing. You know, like personally, you know, I had an evolution of thinking when it came to charter schools. When I first ran for the state house back in 2010, you know, I was I was for charter schools, and then I, uh, at the time, I sat down with Superintendent Warwick from Springfield, and he, you know, he said, Mike, here's why you're wrong. And he sat down and he, you know, he laid it out. You know, this is the impact directly to the Springfield school system. And, you know, this is what this is. And he also showed you, like, here's something that's going on in West Springfield. And this is what it's going to do to Chicopee. And then when you when you start to realize, or I shouldn't say realize, but when you start to come, come to grips with the fact that, you know, what is it that charter schools are intended to do? And so if you answer that basic question with, you know, it's a real outlet for educational opportunities for folks that are in real rural, I'm, I'm sorry, real um, urban areas, you know, where the public school systems are having uh, a difficult time providing the basics for their students, then charter schools in a lot of ways make a lot of sense. But then, you know, there's another part of that question, which is how does it impact, you know, more uh, rural schools, like a district like West Springfield. West Springfield provides a tremendous academic opportunity for all of our students, and I think that we do uh, in a in a pretty cost effective way, I don't you know we're not the top of the heap in what we spend per pupil, but we're also not in the bottom. And I think that the results are speak for themselves. We have a very high uh, percentage of kids that go to college and and other areas. And so, you know, the I had an evolution of thinking, and I I no longer support the charter school model, especially because of the negative impacts that it has to West Springfield. But, you know, there's a lot of differences. Other people, you know, I know, um, you know, Senator, I think Senator Lesser was involved with pro-charter, um, uh, the, the, yeah, the, no, the I've, urban. I've been, I've been again, I, I've, I've been vehemently against the expansion yeah. of charter schools and campaign with the MTA on, uh, on opposition. Yeah. Addition to, I think you're referring to the empowerment zone. Oh, okay. Yeah, which, which actually, to build off Mike's point, there are models of supporting in, within the existing public school system ways to get improvements. I think the challenge with charters is that it takes money out of the public school system when I would argue, and I think we would all argue, you need yeah. to do exactly the opposite, which is put more resources in. And we need to build up and we need to support school systems that are making those challenging decisions to do new curriculum models, to do, for example, in the Springfield school systems, part of the empowerment zone model was to fund new um, uh, vacation, uh, vacation science camps and math, math programs for students that voluntarily decided that they wanted that extra help. There wasn't flexibility, there wasn't funding to do that previously, so those models helped bring in those, those resources into existing public schools, into schools with the same brick and mortar, the same infrastructure 
that they had before. So I think the the three of us are are, un, are united in the in the issue of charter schools because again, I think the model, you know, in other states that don't make the same types of investments in their public school system, you know, maybe you could make an argument about charters, but here in Massachusetts where we've done the hard work over really generations to invest in a really high quality public school system that's really the envy of the whole country, why would we do things that take money out of that system, that take resources you know, out of that system? It, it, it's, it, it's counterintuitive sure. and it doesn't work. And I think what you saw with the response from question two is that the public appreciates that too. And people appreciate the fact that we have a good public school system in Massachusetts. There are certainly places to make improvements. There are massive disparities that need to be addressed, but we shouldn't limit or weaken the actual institution that has been built over a very long time here in Massachusetts that is getting good results. Well, there's a cycle of continuous improvement for sure for mm -hmm. educators, for students, for elected officials. And, and I think ultimately tie up this to, to wrap this question up. I think the idea for me is if we can adequately fund our schools, I see less of a need for a charter school model mm -hmm. because we'll have exactly. everything in our in our district it, that we need to service our students. Uh, properly. And just just to back up real quick, because I think Mike brought up a very important point about um, about funding, uh, because state government is very different than federal government. We have to balance the budget every year. We, yeah. we, we can't print money the way the federal government can. So we have to make very hard decisions every year about what what is funded and what is not. And that brings the question, which I think Mike started to, to bring up, which is very important, I think, to, to make a point about, which is the, the way we collect revenue in this state has become very unfair to middle class people and there is we need to rethink revenue streams and how we increase revenue in order to pay for improvements that are vital to the public school system. So you know, I think part of the conversation about improvements to education needs to be, well, is our tax system fair right now? We've continued to raise the burden on middle class families while reducing the burden for the highest income earners. And if we recalibrate that tax system to make it more fair so that people who have more ability to pay are paying their fair share, middle class people aren't seeing the same uh, increases that have made that have made life harder and harder and tighter and tighter over the last years. We will have the resources to do what we need to do um, to to fully fund the foundation budget review Good. to fully fund uh, the school improvements, and that's got to be that's inextricably linked to the conversation. As an educator, my my primary goals are to make sure that all students, when they complete their education here in West Springfield, anyway, are college and or career ready. And whether they are college ready immediately or career ready immediately. Is, is up to the child oftentimes, or the young adult at that point. Mm, right. But um, opportunities in, in advanced manufacturing, precision manufacturing, yeah. the healthcare industry are, are present here in Western Mass. Matter of fact, we can't fill all the open jobs. Exactly. We're trying to uh, fill that pipeline. But there's been conversation for a long time about how do uh, we keep uh, good uh, hard-working citizens here in Western Mass and prevent them from fleeing to other parts of the country, other parts of the state. One of those ideas is a commuter rail uh, from here to Hartford, here to here to Boston. Can we talk a little bit about, and Jim, maybe I'll just start with you, a little bit about maybe where we are in that process. What are the hurdles? What are the obstacles? And, and why should we work hard to get some more support behind that? Sure. Uh, well, it's been an issue that's been talked about for you know, as long as I've been you know, in the legislature and you know, one that I think is uh, is a is a great idea, obviously, for for Western Massachusetts. And when you speak with residents from Western Mass, you know people who either commute out to the Boston area, whether it's once a week or five times a week, um, all those people, you know, would would love an alternative uh, in terms of uh, transportation. Um, and then, of course, from a social aspect, when you talk to to people, they uh, think about it and say, "Oh, it'd be great to be able to hop on the train and and, and go down and be in, be down to Boston and not have to worry about parking, not have to worry about driving." Um, I think the key component to whether or not we're going to be successful with with rail is one. Obviously, they're doing a, a feasibility study that uh, Senator Lesser had um, uh, proposed uh, through the budget last year, or last year, or last session, two sessions ago. Um, uh, you know, to do the work to find out whether or not it's feasible, both from a you know just from a infrastructure standpoint, and then of course from a, a financial standpoint to determine you know how much it will cost. Uh, but the reality is, when you're talking about a rail line or any type of transportation, um, there's a point A and a point B, or a point B and a point A, 
and uh, there's stops along the way, but we have to continue to push and make the people realize at the under, other side of the line, at the other end of the line, that this will be a benefit to them as well. Um, you know, if you're talking about the Boston area, what is the benefit to people who live in Boston to have an east-west rail? Well, I think we as Western Mass residents can really name, you know, probably tick <laughs> off about a hundred yeah. reasons why we think it would be beneficial to them. But until those people, those residents, the constituents of, the, of our colleagues really understand the benefits to being, to being connected to Western Massachusetts, you know, we, many of us live in Western Massachusetts because we want to live here. We like the quality of life. We like having um, a nice home with, with some space and not having the congestion of, of having to, to deal with traffic and uh, the, the affordable prices of housing and uh, the great schools, um, all the benefits in Western Massachusetts that we hold so dear, we have to continue to sell to the Eastern, our, our counterparts in Eastern Massachusetts. Right now it's being <coughs> sold as a benefit to Western Massachusetts from an economic standpoint, if we can connect the Eastern Mass, we'll benefit from an economic standpoint. Uh, but to make this a reality, um, not only is it going to cost a lot of money, and we have to figure out a way to pay it, more, more than likely the federal government will have to uh, flip you know, most of the bill for that, uh, but we have to make sure uh, that we're still pounding away and making, making people in the eastern part of the state realize the, the direct benefit to them uh, when we have an east-west rail. It can't just be a benefit to us as much as I would like it to say that. It has to be a benefit to all those involved. Sure. And we have to find a way to communicate that and continue to, uh, to market that idea. Good, Eric. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think Jim's point is exactly right. Um, and uh, and the, the, the challenge that we have is, uh, is making that case, but we actually have an immense opportunity because you know the, we gotta use what our great assets are, which is Western Mass is a great place to live. The cost of living is much lower than it is in Eastern Mass. We have a lot of open space, really high quality of life. What we don't have is access to those fast-growing economic sectors with those high-paying jobs. Eastern Mass has the inverse challenge. They're complementary challenges. They've got lots of really fast-growing, high-paying jobs, but no one can afford to live there. It's completely overcrowded. Rent, mortgage rates are just way too high, and there's, you just can't move. The traffic is awful. The MBTA is overcrowded. Those are inverse challenges. East-West Rail would help both ends of the state. It would give Western Mass access to those high-paying jobs. It would give Eastern Mass access to a great, affordable place to live and new housing. It would lift both ends of the state, and that's really the key, um, as, as Senator Welch is pointing out, that we need to really not shy away from making that case. And we've done that. The Boston Chamber of Commerce has been one of the biggest boosters of the feasibility study because they appreciate that eventually the jobs and opportunity will leave Boston also if their workers can't find affordable places to live, if people can't move around. And Western Mass, you know, while we have immense assets and we have a lot of great things happening here, we need to connect ourselves to those high, um, those high growth areas just to our east and just to our south. We are right in between two of the most dynamic and fastest growing economic centers on the entire, in the entire world. So if we don't do what we need to do to get ourselves connected to those places, we are going to be leaving thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of potential new jobs on the table. And I think for people watching, all of us have neighbors, friends, kids, siblings who grew up in, in, in these communities here in Western Mass who would love to live here near their families but have had to leave uh, because they haven't been able to find uh, a good high-paying job. Rail would solve that. And the other thing I would just um, uh, add about costs, no one is saying this is going to be an easy project. Um, it will obviously be expensive, uh, and I don't think it's, it, it's helpful for people to pretend otherwise. But the analysis needs to also include how much it would cost to not do it. Because there's a cost to Western Mass continuing to fall behind other areas of the state. There's a cost to young people continuing to feel like they have to leave in order to find a good job. There's a cost to uh, the la losing the level of growth that we're seeing in other places. That is expensive too. So I think one of the things that we need to, as a, as a group, kind of make the case about is investments in, the, in infrastructure, while in the short term, yes, are very expensive, 
over the long term create immense benefits for all of our communities, Boston included. So it's exciting. We'll see what the mm -hmm. feasibility study brings back, but it's an exciting moment because I think it's a chance finally to make that statewide case about why rail to Springfield is so important. Good. Mike? Yeah, I was just to follow up on what they said, you know, one of the uh, uh, major obstacles, I think, is that I've heard from both Eric and Jim is about the cost. And then, you know, there were efforts um, that would have been beneficial to uh, succeeding in getting or moving forward with East West Rail, which was uh, another ballot question from last uh, last election, which was the fair share amendment, which was unfortunately shot down by the um, the state supreme court that it was unconstitutional. That it was it w what it was asking it was asking people to make uh, answer two questions or give two answers with one question. And so what they wanted to do was, you know, if we do if we implemented the fair share amendment, could the new revenues which would have been, you know, uh, which would have been a tax on the, uh, uh, an additional tax after the first $20,000 of income weekly. So when you think about what it was, it, it made a lot of sense. But then, you know, they wanted to dedicate the funding towards education and also to transportation. And it was ruled that you can't ask a question that was really diverting money to two different sources. It should have been worded differently. And so that was a pretty significant setback, both for education and for transportation. Um, but I agree wholeheartedly with everything uh, that has been said prior to you know my opportunity to speak. In that, you know, we have to do everything that we can as legislators um, to representing the western part of the state to highlight what our assets assets are, and then you know do all we can. And you know, just a simple thing uh, in the House of Representatives under Speaker DeLeo, we have a East West Business Link. And what that does is that is a partnership between the Boston Chamber and the Springfield Chamber and some of the subsidiary chambers out here in Western Mass. But to bring out business leaders from the eastern part of the state that have, you know, needs in advanced manufacturing or, you know, in other areas, medical uh, manufacturing. And so for them to come out and say, you know what, we don't have to you know, partner with a business in Iowa or we don't have to partner with a business in Germany to be able to manufacture the parts that we need for our product. We can do it all right here and in many times make it so that it's more uh, economically viable for these companies to partner within the state. And I think that's, you know, we'll call that baby stepping, but if we can baby step and partner some of the eastern businesses with the western part of the state, that then I think makes the argument for East West Rail, or you know, whatever whatever that next step is, I think it makes it more viable because people realize that, you know, the state of Massachusetts, although we're we're small geographically, we have a great uh, pool. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, there's a huge pool of of candidates for future employees in terms of our you know juniors in high school and our seniors in high school, and uh, you know I think about. Black Friday and what that's turned into, and but I, then I, I think about Small Business Saturday, and, and and really this next question is about those smaller businesses and opportunities for our youth to find their first job, and that is what is what are the implications of the rising minimum wage for both the potential employee in finding a job uh, and the employer in being able to afford to employ uh, mm. more and more people. So, Mike, I'll start with you on this, and and think about you know I. I Again, our, our future graduates are mm. my own uh, oldest child who's going to be looking for a job. And boy, that sounds like great money considering I made two sixty three an hour when, yeah. I was first arrived, <laughs> when I first started yeah. working. Yeah. And she'll be looking at $15 an hour. But what does that mean for the employer and for the pr prospective employee? It, it, it's, it's, and it's incredibly important for the economic uh, viability of many families, increasing the minimum wage. I, I can't speak enough to that. It's incredibly important. And the flip side of that coin is the impact to our small businesses. When we were um, you know, taking votes on, on this in the legislature, I was uh, contacted by many, many, many small businesses, small businesses right here in town, you know, service industry businesses, uh, folks that are running the small mom and pop restaurants, um, I, I won't name them, but they're from town, and, and many of us know them. And the impacts to them, and what does it mean? Uh, what is the you know the real hard impact on businesses? Whether it's the increase in the minimum wage, whether it's sick leave, whether it's all of these things, the smaller businesses that can't pass these costs through to um, the people that are using their businesses, it, it is a real 
real challenge. Now, I personally do support the $15 minimum wage because I think it's it's that important and the cost of living has changed, uh, you know, multiple times over uh, the last decades. And so it, it's probably, it's one of the biggest discussions that we're having, but more importantly to that, uh, Mike, is is what's on the horizon coming that's going to also be impacting. And one of the most important things, and I know that you know, we're promoting it, is automation, right? So we have the robotics team here at the high school. We have all these things. And like, you know, so right now uh, in the 21st century economy that we have, you know, we here in Massachusetts, across this country, across this world, are about to, you know, hit a tsunami of automation, which is going to impact you know, uh, the folks that are driving our goods from place to place, our truck drivers, um, you'll see it in McDonald's. They're starting to automate. You can just go to a kiosk and order your own food. You know, so the next wave of challenges that we're going to face is it's almost upon us and it's significant. And, you know, like we have to rethink as a, you know, as a legislature, as a federal government, you know, how are we going to meet the 21st century challenges of tomorrow? which are really, you know, they're here now. And so as an educator, you're going to have to be rethinking the curriculum that you're providing to students for those kids that may not be going to a four-year school. We're going to have to rethink how we, you know, there's hundreds of ideas out there. And I'll just, I'll just throw one out there, like universal basic income, which is, which is a proposal that's out there to help offset the coming wave of automation so that people are actually receiving income in ways other than you know, um, uh, you know, like a welfare program or something. Like, th there's real challenges on the horizon, and I think the the tip of the spear, if you will, is the fifteen dollar minimum wage, and then what comes after that, and how we're going to provide. Sure, Jim. Well, uh, I think Mike touched on pretty much uh, everything and the challenges that go along with the the fifteen dollar minimum wage or any increase in in the minimum wage and. Um, you know, like Mike and I think Eric as well. I, you know, I support increasing that minimum wage. It's, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes when you hear from from families and people that are uh, working two, three, four different jobs. You know, just trying to make ends meet. And the reality is, you know, the they're not making ends meet. Uh, but as Mike had mentioned too, the flip side is those small businesses uh, really can't or having a difficult time absorbing that increase in cost because they can't as easily as a Walmart or a Home Depot or a chain restaurant be able to pass those costs on to their customers because when they do, those customers are, um, <coughs> you know, um, oftentimes going to look elsewhere. Um, and they don't have the big infrastructure, the small businesses, the small mom and pop shops don't have the infrastructure in place uh, to be able to absorb that, that additional cost. So we have to continue to look at different ways where we can help small businesses survive, encourage small businesses to thrive. Um, that's really the, the, the key there. Um, and I think one area with that, that comes with increasing the minimum wage, we do have to continue to keep in mind uh, that it is having a significant impact on our small businesses. And there are other things that we can do um, that can maybe potentially offset that for some of our smaller businesses. And I think that's really the next step. The first step, increase the minimum wage. The second step, what can we do to help our small businesses thrive and be able to absorb those costs in a way that will be beneficial to everybody? Good. Eric. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, um, Jim and Mike have said it uh, very eloquently. I, I think, you know, there we do have to be thoughtful about the impact on small businesses. Uh, you know, I've heard from many small businesses in, in, uh, in my district as well. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out a lot of our small machine shops, a lot of our manufacturers in Western Mass are family owned, are small businesses, you know, who, you know, have very tight margins that they have to think about. So that absolutely needs to be taken into consideration. I do think just, you know, two things to, to point out about the minimum wage. First is the perception that it's for kids scooping ice cream in the summer as a supplement to, um, you know, uh, to, you know, a teenage, you know, teenage allowance is just not accurate. Uh, you know, the data and the research really shows that actually a huge portion of the, of the folks who are currently on minimum wage are supporting families. And this is their primary way of sustaining themselves. And I just think as a bedrock principle in our Commonwealth, someone who's working full time should not, 
you know, be living in complete poverty. And, and the current minimum wage just does not support someone. Um, and as a result, they have to rely on public benefits and other forms of assistance, which costs taxpayers in other ways. So I think it's, it's worth just acknowledging that factually, that the minimum wage really is supporting a lot of families. And the majority of people making minimum wage are people who rely on that for their full-time uh, job. The other element is, you know, we, we took into consideration the impact on small businesses. So there's a schedule of increases gradually, 75 cents a year, um, so that businesses can plan. They know where it's going, um, and it will and it will be um, predictable and regular, so that um, employers can plan their budgets, which is an important element. And you know, the the point Mike said, he's absolutely right about you know automation and being thoughtful about where the economy is going. We're seeing changes in employment that we have not seen since the Industrial Revolution. And we need to be thoughtful and policymakers need to be thinking about how we ensure that people can still make sustainable livelihoods and can still have the dignity and identity that comes with work in a very rapidly changing economy where there's increasing automation and increasing use of technology. And we haven't all totally wrapped our heads around that, but the process is beginning uh, to think about how, how we respond to that. Good. Well, I think that all of you touched on that. The question really for me was about what is the challenge for our, our students as they go to look for a first job and they're competing with somebody who's trying to support a family. And, mm -hmm. and if an employer knows that a lot of times, right, they may lean towards, I'm going to give this position to the person who needs it for a family versus a yeah. student's first entry point. So mm -hmm. it's, those challenges will mm -hmm. continue to uh, present themselves. Regardless, it's been outstanding, a lot of great questions and, and fantastic answers. So I'm going to close with this. Um, two things. We give you an opportunity if there's anything that you think you'd like to share with, with the <laughs> residents here in West Springfield or, or the community at large. Um, that you think is important and then wrap it up with uh, I always ask for a suggestion of somebody uh, to, to feature in the spotlight so who is it that you'd like to see sitting in one of those chairs uh, having conversations and answering some easy and challenging questions uh, from me so uh, Eric I'm gonna start with you <laughs> okay. um, so anything that you want to share add tie up and then who might you like to see featured in the spotlight? Oh, great. Yeah, so no, I, I just want to say thank you. I mean, it's great. Thanks for in inviting me, Mike, and uh, and for including me. And I want to thank Jim and Mike for, you know, really being great colleagues. And, um, and uh, you know, they certainly represent West Springfield uh, very well at the State House. And uh, it was fun to cross the river today um, to come over. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see... Um, you know, um, uh, maybe Pastor Atu White, who runs the Dunbar, yeah, the Dunbar Community Center, uh, really doing Sprinkling. interesting and neat stuff with Dunbar, and um, you know, and they're they're really growing the programming there. So it could be could be a good person. All to right, have good. I like it. I like it, Mike. I'm going to give you three names. <laughs> all right, <laughs> three names, and oh, they're all boy. over the spectrum. And I just thought of the third one while we were sitting here, but um, I'd really like to see you know Congressman Neal. So, and, and, so here I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you one second. So, so I'm gonna need the three of you to work with me on this. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so Richie Neal's been suggested multiple times on this show. We have reached out, Richie. We've we've reached out. We're looking for <laughs> you, and yeah, yeah, you haven't returned our calls. Oh. So, uh, I, we want it, We want you on the show. Uh, so that's good, Mike. Maybe I, and you I would can just add, I would just say, me. Mike, you know, to that end, uh, Congressman Neal is, you know, in my lifetime, he, he's probably achieved, you know, the highest. Um, possible office of any, you know, guy we know. And he's literally, you know, got the strings of government in his hand and he's meeting on a daily basis with, you know, world leaders and, and trying to resolve problems. And I don't think you could get a better uh, candidate to sit in this chair than him. Uh, now, secondly, and I'm going to go bring it back even closer to local, I would like to see Chris Thompson, and I don't know if you're familiar I, with Chris Thompson, Chris. but he's just um, he's a West Side guy that's made it good, and he's just starting a, uh, a new Star business, Fires. the Westfield Starfires, oh. over a new baseball team over, well, I think it's collegiate, wow. semi-pro, whatever yeah, whatever in, the day. In Westfield, yeah. And nice. uh, Chris would be great. And then, I don't know if he's already been on, but Dan D'Angelo from the uh, West Springfield Boys and Girls Club. Dan, the work that Dan does at that West Springfield Boys and Girls Club and the services that he provides to the, you know, the the families in this community is is exceptional. He's a wonderful guy. I can't speak highly enough about him. So those are my top three picks. Great. So great challenges. So Dan <laughs> joined me a couple of weeks ago with oh, Dan Sherbo uh, oh, okay. to, to promote his uh, his event that the Boys and Girls Club had on, on Friday mm -hmm. night. Uh, 
he'll be back again because we, yep. we like to have Dan on talk about the programming that he does. Uh, Chris Thompson is a great um, opportunity. I just, I just spoke with him the other day, actually, yeah. to uh, see about maybe getting some of our students over to uh, – they're running a, a, a school day uh, game in June uh, to see if we can send some nice. students over there to check out good quality baseball and have a nice experience. Mm -hmm. And Richie Neal, again, we, we're, we're, I need the three to help me to, to bring him over and, and we could maybe have a, a, a round table uh, with Richie if we can make that happen. Good. Jim, you're the closer today. <laughs> closer. Well, it was suggested to me, uh, actually, as we were sitting down, that I should, you know, as you know, I, I have a competing TV show on <laughs> Channel 15. It's a complimentary uh, com show. Complimentary, a I should say. Yes. Uh, come and talk about the Commonwealth. And uh, uh, I think it's a good idea, and it might be um, actually more in, in your niche to, you know, maybe um, have somebody from the Cannabis Control Commission to come in and talk about um, some of the programming that's going to be in place um, or that is in place and that will continue to be in place about informing our youth about, you know, the safety of, of cannabis. And, you know, the reality is cannabis and marijuana is, is now here. Uh, adults can use, uh, purchase and use uh, marijuana or cannabis uh, as, uh, you know, in the safety of their home home, so to speak. But that will increase the exposure to especially kids around the, the, the high school age and the middle school age. And one thing I learned from uh, our trip to, to Colorado a few years ago was, um, although it was initially viewed as a, a real huge challenge, how do we have this conversation with our kids about you know, marijuana being legal? Uh, what it really ended up being was a great opportunity for, for those communities in, in the state of Colorado to have that conversation uh, about a sensitive uh, you know, subject matter. And I think it would be a great idea to, to possibly have somebody from the, the CCC, the Cannabis Control Commission, to talk about how they plan on doing that and plan out, plan on packaging that message to uh, school age kids, um, either through the school systems or, or otherwise. Good. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Yeah. It's been, uh, it's been a, truly an honor to be joined by uh, Senator Welch, Senator Lesser, and Representative Finn this morning here in the spotlight. I hope that you are all better informed about some of the challenges that they are facing as, as legislators here in the Commonwealth, as well as the way that those things Im impact uh, what we do for education here in West Springfield. I hope you have a great day, and we look forward to another segment of In the Spotlight. Take care.